Presents. Um, so um, this chapter was very um, interesting and short. So I'll just um, dive right in. Yeah, so this is the overview. What is a decision tree, data set description, and making predictions, how do we grow a tree? And <clears throat> yeah, so a decision tree is um, one of the supervised machine learning algorithms. And what we do is it, it, it what it's, what it does is um, it either classifies or it does the regression analysis for its, um, sorry, let me start again. So a decision tree is a supervised, learning, supervised machine learning algorithm and it is used for both regression and classification problem. It uses the if else conditions to visualize data and that algorithm that is classification and regression trees. And as opposed to unsupervised learning where we where we do not need an output variable for whenever I want to make use of decision tree, we, we require an output variable. Yeah, now we need to know how these decisions are being made. So to do that, we, okay, data set description. So for this particular um, chapter, we made use of, of various data sets and it's made up of four features and one class and three classes rather. So in the chapter, we made use of just petal length and width, and this code actually called the length and width. So it's, it took all the variables, all the values in the row, and two and colon, which means zero, one, two, three, four, which means two and three. So X contains the petal length and width, and these are the classes what we need to predict. And we created an object of the, of the classifier here with a maximum depth of two and we fitted the object of the classifier calling the the input variable and the output variable so going to the next um screen then after we did that we had to visualize and to visualize we had to you know export the file using this function in the sql entry class and this is how exportation is done remember that we are making use of just two features which is the sepal length the petal length and the petal width. And this is the um, three dots that has been exported. And then um, the target names, we are, we are using the three classes here. So we call the, the target names here. And when we do that, this is what we get. To generate the dots file, we call this particular um, line of code. We can either choose to you know, convert it to PDF or PNG, depending on what we want, when, by making use of this graphics Python package. So this is a sample decision tree. And what we can see here, we can see that this decision tree is made up of um, attributes. So each of these nodes, so, for, so this is a node, and this is also another node, another node, another, they are all nodes here, but this node is called the root node. This is, the condition that we used to get the other nodes. This is a terminal node because for, for this node, there is no um, child node. So this is a terminal node. This is a decision node because from this node, we, we are getting two other nodes and we can see it more clearly here. This is a root node. This is a terminal node, decision node, because from here we are, we are making other decisions. If we also go back, we can see that if the petal length is less than, less than equals to 2.45, then the class is Setosa. Remember that we have three classes, Setosa, Vesicola, and Virginica. And if it's false, it's, then it comes here. And if the width is also less than 1.75, then it either chooses this or this. Because this is true and this is false. So let's move on. And that thing is the terminal node can also be referred to as um, the leaf node. Let's let me try and explain some of what we have here. So this sample size from the beginning, I mentioned that we have um, 150. That's 15 instances in three classes. So that's 54 Setosa, Vesicola, and Virginica. So all together we have 150 samples here. And for the values, um, when we are drawing our decision, when we are drawing our decision tree, we cannot make use of the categorical um, variables. We have to convert them to numerical. So zero means Setosa, one means um, Zero index of zero year means setosa, index of one year means um, vesicola, and, and index of two year means virginica. So we have to convert them to numbers 
not um we can't make use of the categorical um variables so that's what we have here when the petal length is less than equals to 2.45 we can see that it's true for setusa and for vesicula and virginica it's they're both zero zero and when we look at force here for the values here too it's it's um zero for setusa and for vesicula and Vaginica is 50-50, but when we look at this particular place here, if the petal width is less than equals to 1.75, if it's true, then we have this class here, and we can see it's 49 here. This is zero from here because all the classes have been predicted here. This is 49 here, which means one of them should be here, and that's what we have here, and this is five here. So what, what, what we have here is just um, true and false. So let's move on, and this is our it looks like, like I explained earlier, we have the root node, we have the decision node, and when we have no child node, this becomes a terminal node. And we can also say that A is a parent of B and C, and this terminal node cannot be a parent because it has no child nodes. So now making predictions, how can we make predictions? So all nodes apart from a leaf node always ask questions. And like I said earlier, this is all these are nodes, right? This is a terminal node. So apart from a leaf or terminal node, this cannot ask any question because it's a terminal node. And this is asking question, is the petal width, if the petal width is less than or equals to 1.75, it should be this. If it's not less than or equals to 1.75, it should be this. So all nodes apart from a leaf node always ask questions. And also it makes use of a, before we make prediction, we should know that it makes use of a layered splitting process. And it is grouped based on homogeneity and nodes have attributes. So all of these are nodes and they have attributes like samples, values, the class, the gene impurity, the samples, the values, and um, the class. Also for layered splitting process, um, the, nodes are grouped based on, on similarity. So like we have here, if the length is less than 2.45, it brings all the um, values that are similar all together here. And the ones that are not less than 2.45, it brings them here. So these are what we need to note when making predictions. Yeah, and the next slide, how do we grow a tree? Right, if you have to create something like this, how can we create it? First, what we need to know is we need to know the features to choose and the conditions we need for splitting, when, when we should stop and pruning, and then um, gene impurity. So this is the formula for gene impurity. Before we know the features to choose, we need to know the, um, the um, amount of or how impure the gene value is. So this is the formula and this represents the the ratio of the classes among the training instances. So when we come here, we can see, let's calculate the Gini, the Gini impurity for depth to left node. So from the onst, from the um, beginning, we add them, let me see. Yeah, we define the maximum depth as two, which means yeah, zero, zero, one, and two. So if, if I'm mentioning depth two here, that's zero, one, two, and I mentioned the left node. So to calculate the gain in purity now, we know that this is the formula one minus the summation of the square of, of the ratio of classes. Yes, yeah, so one minus, we have this zero here, which is for Setosa and which, which automatically turns to zero divided by 54, which is the sum of the instance at this particular point, which is zero plus 49 plus five, which is equal to 54 and minus 49 over 54, which is 49 over the sum. And minus, minus 12 over 54 square all square. So this is the result when we calculate the gain in purity. And also when let's try estimating the class probability. So for a petal length of uh, this should be length. No, this should be length and this should be width. So for a petal length of five centimeter, this is anything less than 2.5 is true here. Yeah? And if it's um not if it's more than 2.5 then it should it should come here yeah so it's here and um length and the length the width this should be width and the width is um less than equals to 1.75 so if it's less than equals to 1.75 it should be here and 1.5 is less than equals to 1.75 so we come here and we try and estimate the class probability and um in um chapter three we made use of this function predict proba to show the probability um, for each of these, for 
for um, this particular value here. So if we try and estimate the probability from here, we can see that zero divided by 54, the total number here is 54, which is zero. And this um, 49, 49 divided by 54, that's for vesicular, which is 90. And the last one is um, five, five divided by 54, that's 0 0.09. So from this particular place, we can estimate that this, um, and the, for perfect probability, the value should be equals to one. So this is the closest to one. So we can say when we try and predict what is the class for a petal length of five centimeter and the width of 1.5 centimeter will get it as R1. And remember I said that when we are dealing with um, decision tree, we have to convert the categorical to numerical. And then um, decision boundaries. So let's take a look at this um, graph. So let's look at depth zero. So when the value, when petal length is less than 2.45, so this is 2.45 here, right? And the 050 falls inside here. And looking at the width now, so for when, when the depth is equal to zero, we're not dealing with the width variable, so just the, um, just the length. So it takes the whole width. Now, when, when the width is 1.75, this is 1.75 here, so we draw a dotted line here for depth of one. And when we do this, we can see that we have the value of true and false, like we said earlier. And if it's true, 49 of the value, 49 of the vesicular falls inside, 49 of, of vesicular is less than or equals to 1.75, which we have here. So we can see that we have 49 blues here and the last one is here, which is greater than this particular value. So there was an hypothesis that was made that if we are trying, if we, if these values, if they have, if they are not terminal nodes and there's something still at the bottom, this will be where to start from. Yes, yeah, so let me check. Let's go to the next um, slide. And something about them, decision tree is that it, um, it takes a white box approach and not a black box approach because it's very easy to interpret. So by me, just, by me looking at this particular screen, we can easily know what's happening um, under the hood compared to other kind of algorithms that we can't really know what the um, algorithm is using to predict. But for decision tree, it's very easy to know that know what is happening under the hood and also it mimics human level thinking because that's because it makes use of true and false statements so it's easy to know also know what is also happening there and um it handles both categorical and continuous data well so that's for um regression and classification problem and works well on large data sets so it works well on large data sets because it deals with a feature at a time so this is a feature we can't we are not seeing a better lens less than equals to 2.45 and better with less than equals to something. So it's just one feature at a time. So because of that, it's so fast and it can handle complex data and it is not sensitive to outliers. Um, other kind of algorithms, when, when you're making use of them, they are always sensitive to outliers because they, they might either choose to ignore such outlier but for this, but, but for decision tree, there is no, it is non-parametric, non which means that the there are no rules defined, so it just tries to fit into the, the, the data set, the, um, the training data, and that, that's why it's not, it's not sensitive to outliers. And like I said, it is non-parametric, which means it adapts itself to the training data. So um, it was also mentioned in this um, presentation in the, in the um, textbook that CAT is the greedy algorithm. So I'll be explaining that using this illustration. So for instance, let's say we are trying to look for, to count the, largest value and we have different nodes this is the root node this is a decision node this is another node these are terminal nodes and normally what we do is we uh, we use the largest value here as 10 and for a greedy algorithm it takes the, for the second node or the second depth yes it takes the second largest value here as this and for the last when this is a parent node and these are sub node at a child nodes it compares these two picks here as the largest it compares these two picks here as the largest now what our greedy algorithm will do is that it select this as the best because when it was at this um, second depth it thought because this was higher than this right it, it selected this but when we got to the third depth this was higher than 
this and this this was higher than this. So when we add everything we have here and we and what we have here, we can see that this is higher than this. So it's it's not in all cases that the MGRID algorithm is always optimized. In cases like this, where um, for the second depth, it doesn't really tell um, it's it's not. It, it doesn't follow the conventional uh, manner, then we, we'll be having something like this in our data in uh, um, prediction. So let me go to the documents. Yes, yeah, so I and just run through if there are things I omitted while presenting. So we've covered them, um, this, we've covered this, we've covered this and this, and also making predictions starting from the root node. Yeah, and um, for the gain impurity, um, we've also covered this, and this um, allows us to know the features that we have to choose. So if, if you look at this particular place, we can see that this has the highest gain impurity, so it was selected first. And look at how the gain impurity keeps decreasing. So when um, there are no impurity in, your, in our prediction, the gain value is 0.0, .0. so as, like we have here, when it is true, because this is zero, this is zero, our guinea is zero. So fr from the guinea, from the guinea values, we can know what our root nodes, our root node will be. And also moving down, we've also covered the guinea impurity. This is the formula one minus the square of the class that was predicted among the training instances. And there are also other algorithms that we can make use of, but um, scikit-learn makes use of CAT algorithm, which, which is true or false. There are other algorithms like um, ID3, information something, I can't really remember the full meaning, but it, it doesn't make use of just true or false. It, it has like three or more. Yes, and we've also covered this, model interpretation, white box. It's, it's white box because we can see what is happening in the for black box. We can't really know what's there. and. And also for estimating class probabilities, we've covered this. Um, CAT, cost for classification. Yeah, and um, let me see. For yeah, for computational complexity, like like I said earlier, it works best with um, with large training set because it deals with one feature at a time. Yeah, and and for small for smaller data sets, it works by you know setting preset value to true. So it's, but doing so slows down the training time for larger data sets when we sort the preset value to true. Now for gain impurity and, and entropy. So um, you can either choose to use gain impurity or entropy, but the difference between these two is that for entropy, um, gain impurity tries to, for each of our, our node, is it node? For each of our nodes, yes, it's, it sort of makes it, um, Stand make make it it makes a class like stand alone. So what we have here is is gain impurity tends to isolate the most frequent class, or like entropy that tries to create a balanced class. So this is the formula for entropy. There is a minus sign at the front. And um, one thing I no I noticed from here was that they said gain impurity is slightly faster to compute, but from the formula, um, gain impurity is is um the formula is um it's it's log to base ten. Let me see. For gain impurity, is it log? It's not log. Hey, it's moving. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, before I guess we move on from this, um, can you dumb down gain impurity versus entropy? Like, like, I have no idea almost what they refer to. <laughs> okay. So, um, for let me see. So, um, like I said, um, gain impurity is used to, um, we, we use gain impurity to know the features that we should select. Right, and when we calculated gain impurity here, so let me scroll up um, to where we calculated gain impurity. So this is the formula, right, for gain impurity. Well, like, what is it? I mean, I know I, I googled it, and it's like you know the, the I guess the um, uh, what did it say? It was like the variety, I guess, in in the uh, in, in, your, in your set. But like in terms of if, if you don't want to think about it mathematically, if like in a, in a conceptual way, what would it represent? Like how um, different your categories are, or like what's, what's the best way to think about it? Yeah, it it measures how how pure, how impure, and pure your your categories are in that particular node. So it's it's just a measure of let's say like purity. 
So for this so particular it's per point, decision note, or is it the whole thing at, at level zero? I guess. So it's trying to. So it, it it measures for each node. So this particular node has its own um, value for gaining purity for the prediction. This particular node has its own value too. Oh, okay, that makes sense actually. Right. For the gaining. What would that be useful? Like, what's the what's the point of calculating that? So the point is for us to know the features that we should select. So this this has the highest gain impurity. So it keeps decreasing. So, actually. Thanks. Yeah, so so this is a metric for decision trees, right? So remember the way I was asking, like what's the metric for uh, so you can use like a, a classification uh task sorry you can use like you can draw and even if the decision trees are really used to tell you about classification problems right so they're very good for exploring features right? let's say if you you know and, and their importance because it's going feature uh, feature uh, feature then the gene impurity is what's going to help you so i, I found a, a good uh blog uh i can show it once toby's done we can go back to this Thank you. Okay, another interesting thing about decision trees is that they do not require feature scaling. So I, I the, the only thing that we, we can do to our data set is probably we, we can just remove the null values and that's all with when, when we are making use of decision tree compared to other kinds of algorithm. We can choose to either remove the null values or or um replace them with the mean. So um, let me scroll down. Yeah. So yeah, for gene impurity and, and entropy, for when you are making use of gene impurity, um, it was stated here that um, gene impurity is slightly faster. But I, I was a bit confused because I, I felt when you are calculating logs, logs of logs to base two should be faster. I I I still do not know why. It was stated here that gain impurity is slightly faster. I've, I've not gotten that yet, but it's it's slightly faster than entropy when when you are calculating. Um, and um, Toby, I, I think the formula says it all because um, on the uh, the other one, the Jenny formula formula, it was a, a like the um, it was the square uh, square um, squared of uh, right there. So it's just by probability squared. The other one is probability times. Uh, a, a, a log a, like the binary log of a probability is going to be a smaller number instead of like squaring it to, or like um, multiplying it to a smaller number. Okay, let me see. And then that's going to be faster right there. So it's just uh, the probability times uh, the uh, binary lo logarithm of uh, uh, probability. Yeah, but, but then. When you are squaring, it's faster when you are squaring than, than finding the log, the log reading. Yeah, that's why you said it. When you square, when you square it, it's faster. Oh. Okay, then finding log reading. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chima, you're saying that uh, the squaring is faster than uh, finding a log reading? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Squaring. Yeah, I, I was actually confused because on, online they stated that um, when when you are finding log to base two, um, it's faster for your for um, a system to compute because system is base two. So I, I became confused after reading that when they now stated that gain impurity is faster than entropy. But maybe uh, not the, the result of the entropy or Gini is of what is important, and then uh, they when they apply the result of this formula to the decision tree, that's going to um, act faster, not the computation itself, probably. So I, so probably okay. it doesn't matter the, what the form is. Okay. Thanks, Elmira. Now, um, um, like I st stated earlier, for decision tree, you know, it's, it's non-parametric, which means the training data can fit to form a tree-like structure. So we need to, um, um, have some parameters that we can use to regularize the model. And these are the parameters here, the, the main sample splits, the main samples leave, 
we can always um, you know play with these parameters in our skit learn so that we can have better results if not we might end up overfitting the training data and we need to restrict the freedom of the decision to do training yeah this these are other kinds of um, parameters that we can we can use and and play around with yeah and and also another thing we can do is to prune and by pruning we are deleting um, unnecessary nodes nodes that the leaf nodes or the terminal nodes are are not are, are not statistically significant so there's a there's a there's a formula that they used to you know calculate the the to, to test the level of significance of the leaf node and this is how it's calculated using this particular threshold and p-value yeah so for this particular um diagram i struggle to interpret it because what i can just see is this box here that is not here and this line here that is not here so i was wondering if anyone could help with this because i i did not understand what what the um, author did here so the one to the left yeah team i'm struggling to hear you sorry so the one to the left is overfitting how the left is overfitting that's why it's struggling to um get the it, it it's it builds just it builds the decisions right around the all the training data it tries to encompass all of them but the one to the right just basically tries to make more this this should be the right um what do you call it this should be how it makes decisions in a more general in a more general light or yeah i i still don't understand because what we have here the way that i think that this is happening is that so on the right side we are defining that uh, for each leaf you need to at least have four sample so on the left side um, uh, the, the two squares let me see if i can get the uh, but in any case so on the left side uh, uh, that uh, so there are one two three uh, one two three four we have four um classes which is not necessary like uh, very, sorry we, are, we have four uh, decision depths uh, which uh, which is not necessary and then uh, uh, so one of uh, so that line uh, that is omitted on the right side uh, uh yeah yeah kind of so uh, so that line uh, closer to the three number three that you have it has only one sample in it it has one blue in it and then the the, the four that uh, or like two uh, two uh, two in it like one blue and one uh, the other color uh the, the the one that you have uh and depicted as four it has two on its margins so but we we want each one of our leaves at least have four samples so but automatically these two will be deleted on the right side so that's what we end up so we don't care about those so whatever um leaf that has less than four samples it, they're going to be deleted those two um they have only two so that's why they're going to be a um, method so we don't need to like make the, those uh, um classifications basically it's not needed it's not necessary does it make sense yes yes i i understand i understand now but, but my my own my observation is um where you labeled as four let me just draw my draw okay this part can i set let me see this particular place here i don't know why it's not i cannot annotate okay approve okay so let me just okay, as you look at this i think what you're doing is overthinking this and i like almira's um, explanation right so if we think about these classes right in this case we have almost just two classes we have these round things and these box things so for them to come up with a new class here it's a contaminating class right 
and it's because it's trying to overfit this blue here and this uh, whatever color this is. But if, and the same thing here because it found this one outlier here and it's trying to create a new cluster. But now when you specify the minimum leaf samples, then oh, you guys couldn't see what I was doing. So if you look, because it's trying to get this, and it's trying to capture this, then it ends up creating this box and this box. But really, we don't care about that because if you're catching every single box, you'll never have a model that's usable. So we need to get rid of this. And so by creating that every uh, node must have four samples, then we get rid of it. And now we have a much more, even if we know we'll have some false you know, positives and contamination from each color, but overall it's a much more usable model. I thank you. So um, let me move on to regression. So um, like we stated earlier, we can make use of decision tree for classification and regression. And for this particular task, we're defining the depth as two, zero, one, two, and still the same true or false. Yeah, so for regression, so I, I think there was a particular place that was stated here. So if you're trying to predict this new instance 0 0.6, so we look at this um, value here. And so um, X is less than equals to 0 0.197, which is false. And then we come here and X is less than equals to 0 0.774, which and X is 0 0.6, which is here. So this is what we select for 110 training instances that we have here and sample size is 110. So it's, it's very similar to... If you look at this, right, it still goes back to the same thing I'm, I was talking about before we started, right? What's different here is nothing. It's just that it's still the same if then it moves to a new decision tree. It's still evaluating just the same thing that uh, Toby presented. But if you see here, we have MSC and all these things are values instead of classes, okay? That, that's really much of the difference and the implementation may be different, but that's, and remember SVMs and decision trees can be used for both regression and classification tasks. Yeah. And um, also we can also state um, for regular, regularization. So when we define max depth as two, zero, one, and let me see. So this, uh, I, I remember, this was uh, an example of polynomial classification. Remember when you're trying, if you remember that, that chapter, what we were spending time with the regularization was to try and change this format of uh, polynomial classes where they're coming in as, uh, you know, sorry, as this shape, right? It's a U shape. And if you had to keep drawing across to fit the best line, you remember it comes to something like that. And so what we are always trying to is improve the linearity of the model or get new things with this with these classes so that we end up uh, with good predictions, you know? So I just wanted to remind people that about these polynomial classes and sort of the distribution of the data. And because if we're going to draw a linear classifier, then we have to regularize it and so that we have the best fit and a good prediction. Yeah. Exactly, so you can see here no restrictions and minimum sample if of 10, right? You start to see a more stairs, even if it's not really the best, but you can see it's much more better than the up and down, which, so fitting is that when you're building your model, you wanna use it. So if you end up overfitting, then no one can use it. And so it's a waste of your time. And so we want something that can adapt. And I don't know that the minimum sample lift is 10 is the perfect one, but it looks much more cleaner, more than the, the picture on the right side, on the left side of the screen. Yeah. Um, so for instability, uh, for when, when we're making the decision tree, we, we cannot rotate our data. So let's look at X1. This is the decision boundary. And when we try rotating, you can see that it's it's not so good. One, one thing we can do is we can make use of principal component analysis, which 
which, which will be treated in chapter eight. So we, that so when, when we make use of this, we can have like a better orientation of our data. And another thing we can probably make use of is a random trees, which is um, more like an improved version of decision tree. So I, yeah, and, and yet, so this is also for sensitivity to data. So when one value is shifted, this is how it looks like here for the petal length for depth of 50. And this is um, Setosa. This is, um, I, can't, I can't really remember this and this. Mm, and then there's the Sicala, Setosa, and Virginica. I can't remember the color too, but. I think that's that's all in this centuries. Let me just share the my screen for one second about a good example. So so this genie impurity. And so uh, and guys, you see why it's good. I talked about blogging, right? So you, we see that we're finding this. So uh, this guy says um, gene impurity is a measurement of the likelihood of an incorrect classification of a new instance of a variable. If that instance were randomly classified according to the distribution of class labels from the last data set. So you, the low, you can only have like zero or more for the gene impurity. And so we've seen this formula, but the, the example he uses is very good. We like go running. In the, above data, in the data set above here, the weather just ate later to work, we like go running. So you can see a couple of no's and a couple of yeses here and says, in the data, there are two classes in which data is classified, yes, I'll go running or no, I'll not go running. And so if you were to use the entire decision tree as the training set for a new decision tree, obviously not accurate to train an accurate tree. So you, the gene impurity is calculated by that formula. Okay, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on that because we can look at it, but what it say, and this, and actually Toby showed us how to do this using the example it means that there's a 48.97 chance of a new data point being incorrectly classified based on the observed training data. And so gene impurity is for the incorrect classification of labels. And so gene gain, which is similar to entropy, is the concept of information gain. And this is calculated when building a decision tree to determine which attribute gives us the most information about which class a new data point belongs to. So this is really literally like, you know, a forest. And so um, when they say gene impurity or entropy and either all of them result in the same metric, but people like may prefer to use gene again because it doesn't involve the log to, calcu to calculate. And if you see, this is another example of someone showing more detail of the gene, uh, you know, this, this gene impurity. But like I said, this is the metric. If you're gonna say I built a random forest, then the next word I wanna hear is what's your gene impurity or what's your entropy, okay? Just the same way when you tell me you built a classification forest. Because the, the forest, like I mentioned, is to figure out what are the most, what's the weighting of the features that you're seeing. So they show this example and show, what if we decide two is our cutoff? So if we decide two is our cutoff, we correctly classify the blue, and the, and the green uh, circles with a perfect split. And so in this perfect split, it breaks our data set perfectly into two branches, a left branch with five blues and a right branch with five greens. And so if we move this to 1.5 split here, then we see we have an imperfect split. We have a left branch with four blues and a right branch with one blue and five grains. So how do you quantify this? If you're going to tell Judy, how's your algorithm performing? And um, so being able to measure the quality of a split becomes important if we add a third class, red. So if we bring a third class, so now we have a red button, red button and a red thing here. And we have this other split, which has three greens and two, we've moved the red in here. So which split is better? Right, is the question we are asking with the decision tree. Now it's no longer obvious. When we had two classes and it was blue or green, it's better, but you cannot tell me which one we know that it's split. So this is where the gene impurity comes in. And so, for example, this is the whole data set when you have a pure uh, data set. So it's either blue or green by 50% chance. So if you pick blue, classify blue, 
25%. So these are all the probabilities. And then when you calculate the gene impurity is 0.5. And this is how it, it, you know, calculated. And then if you have a perfect split again here, you have a gene impurity calculated of zero. And so a gene impurity of zero is the lowest and possible purest impurity. And it can only be achieved when everything is the same class, only blues or only greens. And if you have the imperfect splits, in this case, we have a gene impurity of 0 0.27, is that uh, it just shows you like um, whatever you're splitting, what the impurity is, and you want the one close to zero, that's the most important. And so if we, so if you look at before the split, we had 0 0.5, left branch with everything uh, zero and right branch is 0 0.25. And so um, here we determine the quality of the split by weighing the impurity of each branch by how many elements it has. And so this value is the Gini gain and that's the entropy. And this, uh, so Gini impurity, probability of incorrectly classifying a randomly chosen element in the data set if we followed the class distribution and the Gini gain and when training a decision tree, the best split is chosen by maximizing the Gini gain, which is calculated by subtracting the weighted impurities of the branches from the original impurity. Too many wordings, but I would say that we're just using these two metrics to figure out when you're splitting your data via the decision tree, how will you determine what's useful for you? Okay, Sina. There's also at yeah. the end of chapter four, um, and the author of this book has, um, there's a link for, uh, you, uh, for his YouTube and he was talking about entropy. That's also, he's just describing, so because entropy is used in like information theory. And then uh, uh, he's just describing using an example of uh, a weather forecast. Maybe you can find it also uh, useful. Okay. Okay. Thanks, I'll check it out. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think uh, who's going to take, thank you, first of all, thank you very much, Toby, especially you are having a hard week and you still made this. Uh, so thank you very much. Please share your uh, PowerPoint on the channel. And um, I would say that, um, you know, what do people think? Do they want to break? Do they want to move on to the next chapter? Do we have volunteers for the next chapter? Or what's the verdict here? Is it Judy again to do the next chapter? <laughs> okay, fine, I'll do it. Um, uh, one thing I would like to see, uh, Chima, I hope you get better. Really, I was yeah. just messing around with you the first time, but uh, <laughs> let me know. You have quite a number of doctors, even if we are radiologists on the, oh, on the call. True, but yeah. um, please don't suffer alone, okay? Okay. I know that uh, you're far away from home, so, uh, and we're very close to you. I know I, I live very close to Georgia Tech, so, and you have my cell, so let me know. Uh, if you need anything. Thank you. Yeah, and then so I would say that, okay, I'll lead the next one. And uh, I would love if anyone has some time and they play around with some data sets, just maybe spend like five minutes showing people what they did. Uh, this is repetition, repetition, repetition. It's how we get better. Uh, if you even find some flashcards, if anyone wants to go through some flashcards that they went through, that would be great. And um, I, I think that's it. Today we're gonna end early. <laughs> really out there, so uh, yeah. Okay, so you know my roll call, Chima. Uh, you think you'll be fine? Do you need to bring you some food? Oh, I'm fine. I'm good. Oh. I just oh. need to change oh. my pillow. I'll be good. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Okay, Abigail. Yeah, I'm good. I'm doing good. Um. Still trying to get used to everything but i think it's it's getting there slowly okay. the, the segmentation yesterday i had some time because this week was busy for me and i did good how, how do you know if everything is saved like i scrolled through the way you told me on the video but um, i don't know is there more to do or that was it oh, that's it i'll check oh. if you've done a few let me know 
To be honest, yeah. I'm going to hand Sina off this project to Sina because he's like a champonier and he's do- crushing it. So <laughs> sure, I don't need I don't to mind. manage it anymore. So i uh, probably have him become an admin. And uh, look, he's done. But I think yesterday I checked there were 30 done already. But he's, he's really rolled mm-hmm. with it. So uh, please. I, uh, I question whether or not Sina is paying attention on noon conference because I think it's just annotating literally. <laughs> <laughs> Please, do not get us Damn it. You know me too, old Jeff. <laughs> you, you have to pay attention to noon conference. Making me look bad, Tina. Yeah. But please, no, no, share like your tweaks, okay, with everyone so that everyone can do it. Um, yeah, don't worry about it. But yeah, okay. Um, okay. Elmira, you okay? Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to add a couple of things for this. Yes. Uh, uh, so one thing that I think it's important is that um, um, decision trees, uh, they don't care, like they don't presume that the data is linear or uh, like nonlinear. That's, this is very important because on the previous ones, uh, we first visualize our data, we just uh, we presume that probably is linear. And if, it be, if we uh, end up like um, underfitting or overfitting, we say that, oh, maybe this is like uh, not linear. Let, let's just do like uh, do some measures to like, uh, um, make it like um, like extract polynomial features or whatever on this one it doesn't assume anything it just starts from the beginning and like based on those decisions so this is like um you're actually saving time not dealing with uh linearity of the data the other thing is that um, like svms uh they are um if if you want to uh, if you want them to do multi class classification for us it's going to be one versus the rest so it, and then going to do it like if you have like 10 classes it's going to uh, do it like 10 times uh, to like or yeah uh, to like get all the information done but this one it's actually is able to do like give us multiple output and do the multi multi classes we started with like all three uh, flower types so that's also an important thing to rem- uh, remember i guess so when you read i mean thank you for these comments when you read papers a lot you'll see that sometimes they're like oh we use the decision tree to predict this that's a very poor task decision trees are for discovery mainly for discovering features so you use them to get to know what features are important, right? And you can see that even the metrics are geared towards, they're not telling you that this is the ROC term, this is the accuracy, right? They're telling you about these impurities and how should you split your data? So sometimes you may have to, we're gonna get to you know, deep learning, which is completely different because it's the modern way to build and I don't expect that most of us will be going back unless the data set is small, is, um, you know, unless the data set is small, then, then I know that uh, you're not going to go back to this basic machine learning components, but they're important to understand what the big deep neural networks are doing. And sometimes, you know, and this is the process, and you'll notice this when we change to the sort of like the second part of the, of the chapter. But when I read a paper and people are like, well, these are the decision trees, then I expect for you to tell me why you think these features are important when I'm reviewing a paper. So you tell me, look, the petal length is not too important if you look at how the tree ends up in the forest, right? Or, you know, but when you're building a classification task and you're saying, okay, these are, because if you think about what we're doing, guys, is looking at the feature space, right? You're looking at the desert and you're looking at all the trees and deciding, okay, this is what's important for my feature. This is what's important. And then now with our clinical acumen, you'll come and say, man, I don't understand. And I could show you this with the example of the work we're doing with COVID. Uh, and you'll see that sometimes people will say race is not important. Then I'll be like, oh, I thought race is important. Well, that's what we've been seeing naturally, right? So then you start to wonder what's wrong with your feature space. Do you have many things that you need to drop off? Because by now we all agree that machine learning does not need to use all features. You need to use the most useful features to build the best predictive model and then understand what's your error gap and what that means for you and what you're trying to get to the end, okay? So excellent points, Amira. Uh, Jeffrey, Night's Watch, aka um, off for marathon. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to follow Sina's lead and annotate more livers. I did not have access to the pen. Apparently, that is the secret to getting things done. But um, mm-hmm. you'll see some work for me this weekend.
Yeah, don't worry about like don't stress about it, guys. I mean, if you get to know me, and I'm hoping that you're getting to know me a little bit on this, that I try not to to adopt hakuna matata. You know, let's all move, let's have fun. If you're watching something, obviously, I'm I have to recharge my my tablet now because Sina is giving us the tricks. So, uh, so so yes, okay, good job, and thanks for not giving up, uh, uh, Leila. This is your second time attending. Did you learn anything new? Yes, absolutely. I, was, uh, I, I understood the uh, material much better listening to it being explained, especially with the blog. Okay. Yeah, I'm still, I gave a talk last week. Uh, you won part, part of it at that point. Please, I want to see some blogs come up. The things that you don't understand, someone else is struggling with and if you can find a way to understand it or write it better or explain it better then you should write it especially it's not that it's not that difficult and i think it's a good thing if you learn to explain it to other people then you understand it better okay uh sina it was good i appreciated this algorithm a little bit better it kind of made more sense uh, it was more I guess logical in my set in, in my in my mind. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate all the, you know, slowly taking apart all these concepts that normally I wouldn't get on my own. So it's, it's been pretty good. Awesome. Uh, Stella. Um, actually, it's pretty good because um, I was watching the video thing you did last week and um, this actually helped. But at, at times I tend to listen to you guys and then go back and read and it makes more sense for me. Especially now through regression tracing when um, I think it's uh, Toby that explained it. As in actually it kind of now makes more sense and I could go back and read it better. Awesome. Toby, thanks again for the presentation. Yeah, Toby. Yeah, thank you. Toby, how are you doing? Uh, is yeah, it a better week ahead? Yes, yes, uh, definitely. Okay, okay. You sound very stressed. Uh, let's talk, me and you, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, see you next week. I'm going to bring up show. I'm telling you, these levels have gone very high. These standards are getting better every week. So, um, so we'll talk next week. Um, Spend some time. If you find anything resourceful, that's why you have that book club channel, dump it there. I am also learning some new things. I'm also consolidating my knowledge and I absolutely enjoy having this one and a half hours with you. So uh, thank you. Have fun. Please go out and vote if you can vote. And uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Toby. Okay. Bye. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.